Welcome to Bethel Baptist. Good morning. Would you please stand? Let's worship together.
Good morning. Welcome once again to our service this morning. We've got a handful of announcements, starting with a reminder of Bible study Wednesday nights downstairs in our fellowship hall, or you can join us online via Zoom. There's never a bad time to jump in and be a part of the learning and fellowship that happens on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. A reminder that our cantata is streaming on YouTube. You can watch it. You can watch it again and again. Give it all the views. <laughs> but it's there, and uh, feel free to share it with your friends. And, um, yeah, enjoy that performance that we did for Easter. Um, reminder of our book nook, our little library that we have downstairs in the fellowship hall. You can uh, borrow a book. You can donate a book. Um, we are asking that they be some sort of Christian themed books. We definitely want some more children's books in there. So if you have any in your home libraries that you haven't used in a while and would like to share, you can put them in there. And if you're looking for a book, check it out and borrow it and um, enjoy it. It is, believe it or not, um, some of us got letters this week from Camp Layel. Summer camp season will be here before we know it. And summer camp this year is $425 for a family to send their child for a week. And so as we do at Bethel, because we love Camp Layel and we love our kids, we start fundraising for them. And we're going to have our first fundraiser next Sunday, right after church. We're going to have a luncheon with some um, Panera chili and some other things. And um, we will be collecting funds to support our kids. Um, what we do is we divide up what we collect and we split that amongst all the kids and we also have some scholarships for first-time campers to help them get to camp so lots of ways we try to get kids up to Camp Layel and um, if you're feeling led you can um, donate directly to the Camp Layel fund just mark that on the your donation and then they will make sure that gets into the fund that we use to support our kids and help send them to camp this summer. And then uh, next Friday, reminder, we have our next game night, 7 p.m. downstairs in the fellowship hall. It's a great time, snacks and board games and fun. You can bring games, you can bring snacks. We always have a selection as well. Um, starts at 7 p.m. and it's a great time of fellowship. We've got our um, J Dollars Bear, and as most of you know, we sent a nice donation. We filled the bear up and we sent a nice donation. And so I have a card from our friends at Haiti Clean Water that I would read. Um, it says, uh, Dear Bethel family, thank you for your partnership and offering for the Haiti Clean Water. Your gift continues to provide clean water for cat Haitian communities, mothers with infant children, and continued employment for Haitian, the Haitian team member families, and ministers the gospel blessings. Thank you, Haiti Clean Water. So thank you all, and we were, as always, are collecting the dollars with the J's and the serial numbers, and we send those down to support Haiti Clean Water. And then lastly, don't forget to um, fill in your registration books there in the pews so we know that you're here. And um, I announced this last week, but just one more reminder, our food pantry is in need of grocery bags, like your Meyer and your Kroger bags and your Target bags, the ones that we all kind of stash in our house and keep in the little cupboard. Bring them in, and we use those to pack boxes for our um, food pantry donations. And with that, would you stand for our scripture this morning? The scripture today is John 20, 24 to 25. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands and the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. This is God's word.
you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, today we come to your house, your church, God. We come to praise, we come to worship you, we come to seek you, and we come to find you. Lord, we pray that you would be here with us this morning, that you would calm our hearts and our minds, that you would uplift us, and you would open us to what you have for us to hear, to learn, and to share. May this worship please you, and may we feel your spirit moving among us. In your name we pray, amen. As we move into our time of offering, we uh, invite our ushers to come forward and remind you that you can support the ministry of Bethel Baptist here in the sanctuary as the plates go by, or you can support us online or at home through your bank, our website, or mailing in a check. You better start. What? Thank April, you. there we are. Almost there. We make mistakes. <laughs> That's how you know it's live. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. 
Jan Wilson will pray for our offering this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, our hearts are full of gratitude. We thank you that you are the source of all blessing. As we present our offerings and tithes, we remember your promise to open up one gate of heaven to honor you with our first fruits. May this be the way of the day. Bless you, Lord. Bless us. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Good morning. It's great to see you all here today. We do have Children's Church. Jan is gathering up her stuff to meet you guys right down here. And uh, we can pray for you. Uh, this is a time we gather together and lift each other up. So how can we pray for one another this morning? Praying for Linda. Linda's in the hospital right now. So they're running tests. Tests. Yep. They're running tests. They're not quite sure. They think it's pneumonia. So but she has no signs of it. So it's a very odd sort of pneumonia. So we want to we lift her up in prayer. How else? Anybody else? Oh. 
COVID has hit four members of our family, not us. Um, granddaughter started it, and she decided to share it with her mom and her uncle and her papa. So my son and uh, his father are both still pretty sick from it. Okay. We can lift up praises. It is a wonderful day out there. Hope you're all planning on taking a walk while you can. It's, uh, it'll be too hot in July. Perfect day. I mean, it just looks just out there just today, just running around. We changed the sign. Praise God for that. So it's been the same sign for about a year. And uh, Vince graciously went out there and, and Cal uh, changed the sign for us. We praise God for that. We praise God for the Easter season that just happened. Uh, uh, as uh, Amy said, the Easter cantata is now available for you to look at online. And um, it has been our most ambitious one in many years. It's worth checking out just to to see the two guys playing the violin, that was just wonderful. So um, we, we had a lot of interesting things. So we want to praise God for that, praise God for uh, all of the people. That the whole Easter season was actually wonderful. So let us go to the Lord with these thanksgivings and petitions. Lord, we're grateful that you have given us such a wonderful time this last Easter. All of the services we did from Palm Sunday to Easter, all, all five services were just uh, wonderful, and so was the cantata, and we are thankful for all the volunteers, thankful for all the people who put their time and their effort into all of that work that, that went into that, and uh, we're thankful for how tired we were on uh, Sunday afternoon that most of us went home and fell asleep and after all the hard work, and we just thank you for that. We thank you for the way you're moving in our church. We thank you for the way you're touching our people. You're bringing people to Christ, that we're having baptisms this year, and we just ask you, Lord, to, to give us an opportunity uh, to tell the world how thankful we are for what you're doing in us and tell the world how much we love you. And we thank you, Lord, for the service, for the people who are here today. And we pray you open up our hearts and minds and souls to your scripture as we examine it here today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, we're Probably going to have a baptismal service sometime within the next six weeks. If baptism is something you're interested in, uh, please let a deacon know um, or a past deacon. So uh, if deacons and past deacons, raise your hands. So not you, Todd. But, you, you know, if you just look around, talk to one of those people. We're planning on something. If that's something that you want, please, please uh, contact one of those people because we're We'd like to do a whole bunch of people at once. It would be so much fun. We are looking today at the book of John. We're continuing our look at the book of John. And we're in John chapter 20 now. Um, John chapter 20, beginning in verse 24. But Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples are saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the imprint in his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my finger in the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands. Reach here with your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. We think of death as an end. From the time of Adam to the time of Jesus, when a person died, that was it. I know some of you may talk about scriptures where Samuel came back and talked to Saul, but there's some debate about who said that Samuel that appears to Saul, who that really is, and what has he done lately? In the last 3,000 years, I haven't one, heard one word out of Samuel. Dead. Death. The last stop. And then Jesus died. And Jesus did something no one else in history could do, including Houdini. Houdini swore he would come back. So far, he's failed. Jesus came back. All right. Get ready. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Okay, all right. Training you pretty good. He is risen indeed. He is risen. Jesus told his disciples that he would be killed, that he would rise after three days. He backed up his words 
during his ministry by uh, giving a lame man legs, by giving a blind man eyes, by raising a dead man from the dead. He showed them in Scripture what was it to happen, and then he did it. And after all of that, it was not enough. Does that surprise some of you? I mean, Jesus did all of that. And even his disciples did not believe. Even here, it's not enough to believe. There's something missing. That's what we're going to work with in the next few weeks. We're going to be working with this idea. When Jesus walks out of the tomb, John tells us that John and Peter went to the tomb and found it empty. Uh, but they found the grave clothes. It says, John chapter 20, verse 6, it says this. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb also entered. And he saw and believed. The word believed there, in context, it means to be finally convinced. It's the last thing that suddenly now I believe. And everything else was unbelief. Even though he may have said he believed, may even know he said he followed Jesus, it wasn't until that mo- moment that John believed. John had seen the miracles. He'd heard the words. Only at this point he is finally convinced. John believed Jesus was the Messiah. But it is only at this point that he believes Jesus might be God. And right after that moment, John stands in the empty tomb. Uh, we see Peter and John leave to tell the other disciples. Mary sits at the tomb and sobs because she does not understand. She doesn't understand what's going on. The angels appear to her. She can't see that they're angels because there are too many tears in her eyes. She doesn't understand they're angels. She just thinks that they're people. And she asks them, do you know where they took his body? The stone had been rolled away, but the body is gone. I want to let you know, I want to point out, Jesus didn't need the stone to be rolled away. Jesus didn't need that. I mean, here in the passage we just read with Thomas, Jesus just appears. Jesus doesn't need doors. The stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out. The stone was rolled away so that they could see in that it was empty. That's why it was stolen away. It was, st- it was rolled away for them, not for Jesus. So they could see the empty tomb. They could see the grave clothes left behind. And that's important to note. Because if Jesus' body had been stolen, I mean, why would the robbers bother to unwrap it first? I mean, have you guys seen mummies from those mummy movies, right? I mean, you know how long it would take to unwrap it? And when you wrap uh, those things, it's all wrapped in a sticky stuff, right? It's all sticky. I mean, to take that off is like, oh, it's all gooey and all eesh. I mean, it's still all fresh. This, is, this would be a really monumentally t- difficult, messy task. Why would anyone take the time to do that? I mean, how long are those Roman guards supposed to be asleep out there? You're going to take time to unwrap the body? You're not going to do that. The cloth was there. They could see it. The tomb was empty. And Mary, not understanding, because her heart is weeping, asked the angels, where did you take this body? And then Jesus comes and appears to her, and she thinks he's a gardener. Where have you taken his body? And then she understands that it's him, that he's come back. He's come back just to comfort her. In our passage today, Thomas, Thomas comes in and refuses to believe, even though he has seen the miracles, right? He has seen Jesus calm the storm. He's seen Jesus walk on the water. He's seen Jesus raise the dead. I will not believe until I have put my finger through his hand and my hand in his side. Where where does that come from? I mean, this sounds like something Carl Sagan would say, not Thomas. Traditionally, we look at this passage and understand that Jesus is reaching them with the good news, teaching them in different ways. He reaches Mary 
with the good news through her emotions. He reaches uh, Peter and John through their intellects. He, he reaches, he meets uh, Thomas, uh, you know, he reaches Thomas uh, by giving the doubter proof, right? Mary through her emotions, Peter and John through their minds, and the doubters with proof. This is what John wants to show us. We see it. We want to make sure we saw it. We have to understand, though, that there's something here that's not obvious. There's something missing in all of this as they come to understand. Um, Jesus appeared to them. Some of us may not remember or have, have, have understood this, right? Jesus appeared to them right here on this day, but he appeared to them for over 40 days. For the next 40 days, Jesus walked the earth. He appeared to them. He taught to them through Scripture. All the Scripture that he taught to them for the three years of his ministry, he has to reteach it to them because their eyes weren't open then. They didn't understand what Jesus was saying. They couldn't see it. And he has to reteach it for 40 days. That doesn't bother Jesus. He loves them. He wants them to understand his plan. He wants them to understand what God is doing. He loves them. But he has to do it all over again, almost as if, they hadn't heard a word he said in their ministry. I mean, doesn't that sound like every teenager you've ever met? Oops, we have two teenagers here. Uh, pardon me, boys. Forgive me. There's something missing, though. John, Matthew 16, 21. Matthew 16, 21. Jeez, this is something we have to understand. While he was walking on the earth, he tells them over and over again, I'm going to die and rise again. Over and over again, I'm going to die and rise again. And then when he dies, no one believes it. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised upon the third day. Over and over again, he teaches them this. And yet not one of them believed initially. They all had to be brought to him to understand. The disciples with him three years, the men and women both, he says this over and over again, no one understood. He had to appear to them. He had to teach them all over again from scriptures that the Son of Man must die and then he will raise, be raised again for the forgiveness of sins. It's something they didn't understand. Something was missing in those three years. John doesn't write about it in this book because in his book, he's set to correct people who were teaching false things. So he wants to correct people. He wants to correct the teaching that people said that Jesus wasn't all God and all human. People weren't teaching that. People were teaching that he was only God. That when he came back, he came back only in a spiritual body. Well, John wants them to see that he came back in a physical body. Uh, that he asked them to touch him, uh, that he interacted with them, that he taught with them, that he sat down and ate with them. And not only ate, he cooked them a meal. He cooked for them. He was all human. He, he wasn't resurrected as a spiritual body. He was re resurrected in a body like we have. And he wanted to correct other false teachers who said that he was only man and not God. Oop, excuse me. Only man and not God. He answers them as an eyewitness, as one who was there. By showing that Jesus who calmed the storm, he shows us that Jesus who calmed the storm, it was Jesus who raised the dead, it was Jesus who raised himself, it was him who will be judged, it is him who will lead the Lord's army, who will make a way for us in heaven if we follow him. Amen? Amen. What's missing? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what's missing. John's not concerned about that in the book, but it is very, very important for us to note. He's assuming that we understand the Holy Spirit's in charge of all of this and that something's going to happen after. He's assuming that we have read the other Gospels and the book of Acts. John's assuming all of that. I mean, as he ends this book... Uh, you, know, the, you know, the others you know, end with Jesus ascending into heaven, end with the Great Commission, end with all of these glorious things. John's, John's ending of his book is a personal encounter just between him, Peter, and Jesus, a personal conversation that some others had overheard. It's, it's really a personal look for John. But the Holy Spirit is what's missing. We look at the passage, we affirm 
people can be reached with the gospel in different ways. Every person here can probably share a different story about how they came to know Jesus. God op- how God opened your heart. Some of us had to be beaten down in despair like Mary. Some of us came to God because we realized the truth of the gospel. And some of us were doubters and God gave us proof. But none of it would happen without the power of the Holy Spirit. We do not go into the world to find God. We are not the ram in, on some sort of major quest looking for God. We are the lamb who is lost, who is found by the risen Savior. Jesus rose from the dead. He came to tell his followers, the artists, the scientists, and the doubters, and he proved himself. He taught them from scriptures himself, and he did this for three years, and then he died, and then he had to do it again for another 40 days. He loved them, that's why he did it, and he loves you, and he's willing to still teach you and teach me. So why is all of this important? This is all important because it is not on you to save the world. It is not on you to save save the world. Turn to your neighbor and say to them, it's not on you to save the world. Now turn back and say, surely you're not saying it's you. Just make sure it's not. It's not on us. First, we understand the world has been saved. The world's been saved. So none of us need to save the world. Amen! Amen. It's been saved. Jesus has done it. He did that on the cross. Nothing more to do but to tell the people it's been done. It has been done. Nothing more to do that they can escape judgment because of the risen Savior. And we say risen Savior on purpose because every other Savior in the history of the world is dead and gone. And ours is still alive. Ours is the only one that proved he could save us. Now, Mary saw the risen Savior. Mary heard him say, I am the resurrection and the life. And more than that, he heard him say, I'm right here. John and Peter, Jesus said, I am the one to fulfill all scriptures, the Messiah, the chosen one. And then he did it. And then he came back and showed them how he did it. Thomas. Thomas, Jesus says, I am the one who can answer every doubt. We have a job as a church. As a church, our job is to share the fact that Jesus is not dead, that he is risen, that, he's, that, that, that we are not saved by obeying a set of codes or behaving in a certain way, or learning certain formulas and repeating them over and over, or or to give a, a lot of money, or to live a perfect life. All you have to do is know him. That's the church's job. All you have to do is know Jesus. That's the job of the church. Remember, the church is not this building. The church is us. It's the people. The people who gather together. We are the church. And it's not just us that make up the church. It's all the other people who are meeting all days of the week, to learn about Jesus. We are all the church. We all gather to share the gospel with one another and then to take it out into the world. Now, as we share the gospel, we can identify which kind of person we're dealing with, right? The emotional person, we answer with Christ's love. The intellectual with the teachings of Christ. The doubter with the proof of Scripture. But our job as a church is not to save them. They have already been saved, Our job is only to share the gospel. Amen? Only to share the gospel. They will receive salvation because it's already been prepared for them. Now, as we've talked about over the last couple months, that may be the job of the church, but it's not our job as believers. As believers, we have a different job. Mission of the church, share the good news. Mission of each of us as we follow Christ is a little different. Church is a corporate body. It's mission, share the gospel. But believers' mission is a little different. As individuals, we're not to save people because Jesus has already done that. Our job is to find a need that someone has and meet it. Find a need and meet the need. We are to do good works in the name of Jesus and then take no credit for it. 
good works in the name of Jesus and take no credit for it. How we do this as individuals, as a church, has changed over the centuries. If the world changes, the church responds. If the world has a need, the church changes to a different need. In the Middle Ages, the church responded to a cruel world with hospitality. People came to the church for what they called, they called sanctuary. A, a place to come where you could have peace and quiet. A place to come where you could ask questions a place to come where you could worship and be safe. But more than that, it was an actual place for refugees. The church was. And you may remember in the, in the book, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, right? Esmeralda flees from the court into the church and asks for sanctuary. The bishop takes, it in, takes her in because the crime that she's been convicted of and the judge who sentenced her to death the church felt that they were wrong, and so they took her in, and she was protected. While she stood in the church, the law outside could not touch her. Sanctuary. It's a story. But that story is based on truth. This thing that happened with Esmeralda that, that Victor Hugo writes about, this happened all the time. People came to church for sanctuary, and they were given sanctuary over and over and over again. They had three different court systems in France, right? One for the rich, one for the poor, and one for the clergy. I mean, you think about how, how difficult it is for us to keep corruption out of one court system, and they had three. It was a mess. And people needed a place, and the church was that place. They tried to be Christ to the people. And this is how they responded. Now, we don't do that kind of thing in our culture. You can't escape justice by running to a church in the United States. That, that doesn't happen. But here in our church, you can get food. You can get prayers. You can hear the gospel. Uh, some churches give food and some shelter the homeless, some clothing to the naked, some showers for the dirty. There's a church in California that fixes, fixes cars for free. So I guess that's wheels for the befooted, right? They find a need and they meet it. As individuals, we ask, how can I be Christ to someone who needs him? How can I be Christ to someone who needs him? It may be that all I have to do is just listen to someone. Ask your neighbor, did you hear that? I know half of you missed it. And you think, what is it that I was supposed to have heard? Yeah. Tell them later. Thomas doubts. Thomas doubts. Thomas had heard all the words of Jesus. He was with Jesus from the beginning of the ministry. Thomas saw all the miracles of Jesus, healing the sick, the blind, Jesus raising the dead, walking on water, calming the storm. Thomas knew the fellowship and love of Jesus. He was one of the people Jesus called a friend. And his friends, his friends, the ones that he trusted with his life. Do you hear that? He trusted these men and women with his life for three years. He doesn't believe them. He doesn't trust them. Even though he's heard the words of God, he hasn't heard them. Wouldn't you think someone who had seen all that Thomas had seen who had been through all that Thomas had been through, would believe? He would not need to see Jesus physically to know that what his friends were saying was the truth? It's not enough. Jesus had to come to him. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, no one can believe. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, no one can believe. There have been Sundays when I, I've preached and I've closed my sermon in prayer and I've thought, oh, what a brilliant, brilliant sermon. And I, I come up there and I expect a whole bunch of people to come forward and no one has come forward. And there have been some Sundays when I've preached and at the end I've thought, oh, is this the Sunday that they grab me, take me around back, tie me to a stake and burn me to death? 
Praise God, you've never done that. It's the next Sunday. <laughs> you're, you're getting the wood together. It takes a little time, yeah. <coughs> but at the end of one of those sermons, four people came up and dedicated their lives to Christ. I had one time. You, you know, it's not my brilliance or my power or my wisdom that this church exists. It's not based on any of that. Uh, it, the church doesn't exist, survive, or thrive on my power. Amen. It doesn't. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the odd thing is, is the more we trust the Holy Spirit, the more power we have. We come to this table. This table knowing Jesus died on the cross for us. We come and gather at this table and the cross and celebrate his victory. His victory, not my victory, not your victory, not the church's victory, not history's victory, Jesus' victory. We gather and we celebrate. We celebrate that Jesus is the one in control and not us. And not me. We try to put Jesus in control. We try to live and pray and act like that's actually true. Which, because we're human beings, can be difficult sometimes. I'm not just chastising you, I'm chastising myself, right? We all want to be on that throne. We all want to be in control. But it's Jesus who needs to be there. And praise God, we've had brilliant moments where that's been actually true. He moves through us. We ask God to forgive our sins. Some of us, some, some of the sins which include thinking, Lord, I'm the one in control. I'm the one to lead God's people. I'm the one that should have the power. But we know it all belongs to him. And we should give it all to him. We gather at this table thankful our job is not to bring people to Christ. Our job is only to share the good news that they have been saved. And they can come and join us in doing what we do here. In sharing the good news. As we gather around this table, I want to make sure we understand and know that anybody that knows Jesus Christ as their Savior is welcome here. Anyone who comes to know Jesus as Savior is welcome here. And we gather here today as the church to remember what Jesus has done. To remember our Lord is risen and not dead. But he did die for our sins so that we would know his power, we would know his love, and we would know his grace. Let us prepare our hearts to receive his blessing. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, Lord, I ask you to forgive my sins. I ask you to forgive my sins since the last time I've been at this table and ask my, you to continue to forgive my sins. The, the ones I keep asking you to forgive over and over and over again which I know you don't remember because you forgave me the first time I asked. But somehow, Lord, I find it hard to just let go. I just ask you again to forgive me for asking, but still forgive. I put myself on this table, Lord. I don't do that often enough to put myself here as a sacrifice to give up my will, to give up my desires, to give up my life. And put those in your hand because I know you will return them to me and bless them and multiply it and make it better than it ever could have been. I ask you to give me that opportunity to, to love you and to be blessed. As we come, we thank you for all you have done. We ask you, Lord, to continue to love us in forgiveness. And remind us that we are yours. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said? We ask our uh, deacons to come forward, please. As I said before, anybody who knows Jesus as their Savior is welcome at this table. Anybody is welcome at this table. So we ask you, though, to look at your hearts and make sure you are worthy to know and take. Let us share communion.
the night that Jesus betrayed, he blessed the bread and broke it. He said, this is my body. Eat this in remembrance. In the same way, he took the cup and he blessed it. He said, drink this in remembrance. the tradition of our church to close a communion service by uh, parading by this basket which is a benevolence fund which we use to help people in the community and in our church we ask you to consider giving to our benevolence fund this morning as uh, we conclude our service and then we gather around into a circle and close with the Lord's prayer and his song uh, so would we please gather in a circle don't feel bad if you can't put anything in the basket that that's just uh, it's, it's just there uh, don't feel, but let us go ahead and, and make a circle. Now may the Lord bless you and give you an opportunity to share his grace, his love, and his joy with someone who desperately needs it. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.